to the UNAM seminar. It's my great pleasure to uh, present Professor Kronig from Israel. He started out as an electrical engineer and made a gradual tr uh, uh, transition uh, from electrical engineering to physical organic electronics, then to uh, materials chemistry, and ended up in material science and interfaces at the Weizmann Institute. He's their chairman and pro uh, full professor in the department. He has spent postdoctoral studies in Minnesota, and as I said, the uh, undergraduate studied in Israel at Tel Aviv University, and also the PhD is from Tel Aviv University in Israel. He's right now working in theoretical material science, mainly using density functional theory, but also many body perturbation theory, and he's an expert also on the band gap problem of density functional theory, how the molecular orbitals are responding and how they respond in the <coughs> continuum models and so on. But I think today the talk is probably a little bit different, so this will be on understanding molecular and hybrid crystals from first principle. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the kind uh, invitation and introduction. I hope you can hear me also at the back. Yeah, okay. So, uh, indeed, today I'll be telling you about some of our recent work on uh, molecular and hybrid uh, crystals, and I'll explain what I mean by that as I go along. Uh, before I address the science itself, of course, obviously I didn't do all the work that I will show today uh, strictly by myself, so this is a fairly recent uh, group photo and some funding sources, and I will acknowledge specific students as well as collaborators uh, as I go along. So the first thing I would say as a, as a general rule is that if I think about uh, computational material science, I tend to think of it as a triangle which has three important corners. One of them is obviously the properties of materials. What is it that we wish to calculate of which material and why? Second is the formalism, which basically means, okay, how are we going to do that? What equations do we have to solve and are they good enough for that? And the third corner is the computational methodology, which means, okay, suppose that I know what I wish to calculate and which equations I wish to solve, how am I actually going to do that in terms of the underlying mathematics and the underlying uh, uh, computer software that can actually do that in a reasonable amount of time on a reasonable machine. <clears throat> so these are generally the three corners, and progress is, of course, interdependent because sometimes new properties challenge the formalism, New formalism enables new properties, but also demands new computational methodologies, etc. It's all interconnected. So what do we do in our group? Of course, one cannot and indeed should not do everything. So on properties of materials, we've done many things over the years, but in recent years we've been focusing on organic and hybrid materials, and I'll tell you much more about that as I go along. On the formalism, we've been focusing generally on what's known as orbital dependent functionals in density functional theory. This talk is not devoted to formalism, but I'll tell you a little bit about it as we go along. As I said, it is interdependent. Computational methodology is not something I will talk about today, but generally speaking, we are uh, developing real space methods, which means that we're solving the equations directly on a real space grid and not by expansion to some basis set, as is typically done theoretically. This has advantages for very large-scale machines for the next generation of computing. As I said, I won't be discussing it today, but if it's of specific interest to anyone here, I'm certainly happy to uh, discuss it after the talk. So that's kind of a very broad overview. And just in one slide, as, as, uh, as Ulrich already pointed out, our main tool, not only tool, but main, definitely main tool is density functional theory. And in a nutshell, that means that the fundamental variable is the density rather than the wave function. And what this means in practice is that it lets us map the formidable original many electron problem into an equivalent problem that is in principle much more system. And that's a system of non-interacting particles. So you see that the wave function of each particle here is a single electron wave function. And it's basically a Schrodinger-like equation known as the Kohn-Sham equation which has the usual kinetic energy term and usual attraction to nuclei term. And then all of the many electron physics is really incorporated in these two terms, the Hartree potential, which is really classical electron repulsion, and then an exchange correlation potential that is everything else. Now, what does it mean that I mapped the system? It means that the density of this 
non-interacting electron system as constructed from the orbitals would rigorously be the same as the density of the original system, which means that I can also make a connection in terms of the energy. And the most surprising thing is that this is actually not an approximation, this is an exact result. Every, every system can be mapped in this way. The thing is that it's almost always exact in principle, but approximate in practice because this exchange correlation potential, which is also a functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy, which is a functional of the density, which is what gives it the theory its name. But without going on to all those details, we know that it should exist, but we don't know what it is. So it's exact in principle, in practice it's always approximate, and therefore there is this back and forth that I mentioned earlier with the formalism, because a certain approximation can be good enough for one material and one property and maybe not sufficient for the other material with some other property, so it's work in progress. The good news is that we do have approximations that are very useful already for very broad classes of materials, which is why we can actually do something that's meaningful, and I will show you more examples of that as I go along. Okay, so as I said, one topic of interest to us is molecular crystals, and the question is, first of all, what is a molecular crystal and why is it so interesting? So a molecular crystal is really a three-dimensional periodic uh, lattice like any other uh, crystal around us, metals, silicon, semiconductors, insulators, whatever. It's fully crystalline, except that the basic building block is a molecule and not an atom, and the molecules are held together by weak interactions. Most live under Wallace interactions and or hydrogen bonding. Now, why does that even matter? Because molecular crystals are all around us. For example, if you have a headache, maybe from this talk, and you need to take an aspirin, then what you are really ingesting is a molecular solid of acetyl salicylic acid, which later, of course, decomposes once uh, inside uh, uh, your system. On the opposite end of doing something that's medically beneficial are energetic materials or explosives, and the most famous of those are the infamous TNT, which really stands for trinitrotoluene, which is again a molecular solid. Coming back to a more benign application, organic electronics, so this is an example of an OLED uh, television, organic light emitting diode. So again, not all of it, but some of it is based on, um, again, on a molecular crystal, in this case, pentacene, which is an interesting organic semiconductor. So there are many practical reasons to think about uh, molecular solids in very different areas of, of both science and engineering. There's also a basic science question here, and that is that although the molecules are held together by relatively weak forces, it turns out that it's still enough to create collective effects. And what I mean by a collective effect is, the, is a property of the entire ensemble of molecules, the entire molecular solid, which is very different from the property of the isolated molecule, and one that cannot be predicted just by thinking about the isolated molecule, but rather emerges through the interaction of the different molecules to form the ensemble that is the molecular solid. And today I will show you some examples of this, and I will talk about mechanical, electrical, and optical effects. Uh, so that would be more or less the first half of my talk, and then I will um, move to hybrid uh, organic and organic structures, and I'll tell you about that separately. So the thing about collective effects is that, you know, this is usually beyond what you will read in, say, a good textbook of, of molecular uh, physics or molecular chemistry. So the one thing that first principles calculations are really good at is to help us build new intuition because since they are not based on a model assumption but rather by on directly solving the relevant quantum equations, we can use them as a tool to get intuition from. And I will show you some examples of that as I go along. So in addition to the uh, molecular crystal examples that I already gave you, all of which were man-made in one way or another, it turns out that sometimes Mother Nature also likes molecular crystals. So here is, a, I think, a visually striking example that is known as uh, uh, structural colors. So this is work done with Lee Adadi, Steve Weiner, and Leslie Zerowicz, all of them uh, at the Weizmann Institute. And they became interested, so uh, Leah and Steve have a long-standing interest in, in uh, biological minerals. And they became interested in a molecular solid based on guanine. So basically you see here a fish 
in this case the Japanese koi fish, and if you look at a certain scale of this fish, it's iridescent. And this is of course well known. But what is perhaps not as well known is that this iridescence is not achieved by some pigment or some dye material, but rather it is a completely structural effect. If you look at this scale under the microscope, what you see is a molecular solid made of guanine, and then some fluid, some intercellular fluid, which basically is like water as far as the optics is concerned, and then again guanine, and again the uh, liquid, etc. And basically, why guanine? Well, first of all, guanine is a uh, nucleic acid, so it's the G in the AGTC of our genetic code, so it's there anyway. Every, every organism uses it. When uh, packed into a solid, it turns out that it has a, ve it has a very high index of refraction, more than 1.8. So basically you have an array of low index of refraction, high, low, high, low. So it's basically a multi-layer optical reflector just like in your favorite optics textbook. So clearly the fish read the book because it knows how to do that. And what you get because of that is the iridescence. Now this also the same material also appears in other organisms, say in this white widow spider, not to be confused with the black widow spider of course. It's much more benign and it likes to blend against the white background. And the way that it does that is it uses the same material, but now in a random configuration, which means that it's a random scatterer, which means that it's white. Okay, so all this is known. In fact, has been known for a while. So what is the scientific question there? The scientific question is, well, what's the crystal structure? If it's a crystal, what is the crystal structure? And surprisingly, the first attempt to uh, really address that is rather recent. It's from 2006, and the reason that it had to wait that long is because the biological crystals are very small, so it's very hard to infer the structure directly from working on them. So this is from a group in uh, Newcastle in England, and what they did, uh, they said, okay, if we can't work with the biological samples, let's synthesize it in the lab, and if we create those crystals artificially, then we can solve the structure using the usual X-ray diffraction-based methods. And they did that, and they came up with this very interesting structure, which is really a 2D material, in the sense that you see that you have individual layers. This is what a layer looks like, and then the layers are stacked on top of each other. So it's just like graphite or boronitride in the sense that you have stacking of perfect planes. The difference, of course, is that in graphite or in boronitride, that each sheet is a perfect covalent or end or ionic uh, uh, layer, so network. And here it's actually a hydrogen bonded network, so you can still identify each individual molecule. Here's an individual guanine molecule, and you can see that it repeats again and again and again and again in the plane. And they are interconnected by, a multiple, by multiple occurrences of hydrogen bonds. Are these different layers matching, or are they twisted like in more effort? So we will, we will get to that. That's actually a major point of what's coming. So one thing that I did, so this is fine, and this, this is perfect work. I'm definitely not here to criticize it. It's great. But one thing to keep in mind, to go back to the slide that I already showed you, is that often in molecular solids you get more than one crystalline structure. And this generally falls under the name of polymorphism. In fact, in all the examples that I showed you, I just didn't dwell on it, I showed you at least two different structures. And sometimes there are more depending on, on the specific example. And it's very important to control uh, the right uh, uh, polymorph. For example, here, whether it's the one or the left or the one on the right will affect its solubility and therefore how effective it is medically. Here it will affect the rate of explosion and here it will affect the electronic conduction. So it really matters. Going back to the biological example, the question was then, is this really the correct structure also biologically? Because there were all kinds of hints coming from electron diffraction that maybe something isn't quite right. So this is where the computer can really help. Can we figure out what are stable structures on the computer? So the answer is yes, but before that there's something else to think about, and that is that we have to deal with structures that have very weak binding motifs, van der Waals or hydrogen or a bit of both. And it turns out that in usual approximations for density functional theory, these uh, interactions that are weak are really captured very, very poorly. 
which means that if we just take one of the popular uh, software and use it as is with a, a popular functional, it's not going to get us anywhere. So one idea that has been around for a very long time is just to add dispersion correction terms. What does that mean? It means that we know that the dispersion or the van der Waals interaction between two atoms goes as some coefficient over r to the power of 6, where r is the distance between the atoms. So we can add that in between each two atoms if we know what the coefficients are, and if we add some damping functions that basically let this correction kick in only in the long range, only asymptotically, and not when the atoms are too close to each other. So this will depend on r0, which is the van der Waals radius. So this is a very old idea, can be traced back all to the 70s at least, if not earlier. Problem is that it most of the time wasn't very useful because it depends on what I will choose for these coefficients here and for these damping functions here. And if I have too much freedom, then I can get basically any result that I want and I haven't done anything, right? So the thing is that uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Alex Trichenko and Matthias Scheffler in, in Berlin uh, came up with a very nice idea of how to get these coefficients really from first principles, basically by calculating one, them once and for all for atoms, and then scaling them according to the local environment that they're in, according to whether the density is more localized or less localized per a particular atom. Without going into all of the details, uh, we collaborated with, with Alex and, and Matthias very early on to see if that works. In fact, we were the very first users of this method, I believe. And Alex confirms it. So here is the result. It's based on a set of molecules known as the S22 set. It's a set of 22 molecular complexes that are weakly bound to each other. Now, there's all kinds of acronyms here corresponding to a zoo of various functionals, so various approximate exchange correlation functionals. All of that doesn't really matter. The only thing that really matters is to see that those 22 complexes are partitioned into three groups those that are mostly hydrogen bonded, those that are mostly van der Waals bonded, those that are a bit of this and a bit of that, and then the overall statistics. So there is a bunch of functionals here, never mind the details, a confusing array of letters and numbers, it's just you know, mostly the people that came up with this, doesn't matter. And then all of them, except one, but doesn't matter right now, with all of the, with these corrective terms. And you can see that there are huge errors without this correction, like here or here. But those corrections fall, but those errors fall to a level that is entirely tolerable once those corrections are put in. So this is really something we could then work with predictively. And this is exactly what we did in the case of, of guanine. So this was the work of my student Anna Hirsch, who has since uh, graduated. So here's what we do. Here's one common approximation known as PBE, never mind. If I just calculate naively with this, this is the error in the lattice parameters with respect to experiment for the structure that I just showed you. That's unacceptable, it's too large. However, if I put in those corrections that I just mentioned, all of a sudden I'm within a few hundredths of an angstrom from experiment. That's definitely good enough. So we work with this and then what Anna did is she built a bunch of different possible polymorphs on the computer with the sole guiding idea being let's maximize hydrogen bonding because there is a lot of hydrogen bonding going in here. So based on this, she created a bunch of structures, graded them by energy, and found out that indeed the most stable one was the synthetic one that was already known, but there is one that is essentially as stable within the accuracy of the calculation and is different. It's also monoclinic, but different. How is it different? It's really the same in the plane, but it's different if I stack the planes. So you see that in one case, one uh, plane is shifted uh, from the other along the long axis, and then the other along the short axis. So, yes, please. Uh, uh, when you say that uh, she created several versions, uh, is there a systematic way of uh, making sure that every, uh, you have looked at every possible configuration? So, Right, so in this case it was based on chemical intuition, so it's not systematic. There are also uh, many different groups that are working on algorithms to look for polymorphs, let's say, more blindly, so that you don't have to be led by chemical intuition. I would say that both approaches are good. Of course, the blind search is much more costly. So if you do have some chemical intuition for the specific case, if you are not blind in this case, which was the case, then it's better to use it. However, if we had not had it, or if we had found that it's insufficient, then one can do something more sophisticated. So there's both. Uh, 
In this case, it really was enough, and how do we know it's enough? Because once we have a candidate structure, which at that point existed on the computer, we can go ahead and ask the software to calculate what its x-ray diffraction pattern should look like, and this is what you see down here. You see that this agrees very well with samples, actual samples taken from the fish or from the spider, but it doesn't agree well at all with the synthetic form. For example, you see that these two peaks here down at a small d star are very close, and here they are quite apart from each other. So you can really tell that this hypothetical structure really is the one that's biologically possible, but not the other way around. And you can also see that, for example, especially for the fish, but also for the spider, the actual experimental spectrum is way too broad to really solve backwards like you would normally do. You really need to first come up with a candidate and then see if it fits or not. Lattice spacing is probably just a touch different, first of all, because these are zero Kelvin uh, calculations and the measurement, of course, is at a finite temperature. And besides, usually when you compare theory to experiment, you do something called Ritfeld refinement, where you fine tune the lattice parameters, and we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But I was meaning, what is the meaning? If I shift this over, do you know which parameter corresponds to it? Which yes, slight changes in the lattice parameter, mostly in the stacking okay. distance. So more recently, uh, the same experimental group was looking at a different biological material, a different molecular solid, which turns out to be responsible for the vision of uh, uh, decapod crustaceans like you know, lobsters and prawns and those kinds of uh, animals that you see here. So this is a, a schematic uh, uh, diagram of their vision. It turns out that it's based entirely on mirrors. There are absolutely no lenses anywhere. All of the optics is mirror optics that eventually brings the light to these elements in green here, which are known as rhabdoms, and they're the equivalent of the retina in our eye, so where this gets transformed into electrical information. And all of these mirrors are based entirely on this material called isoxanthopterin. So again, that's the parent molecule, and that's how a hypothetical sheet would look. Here again, there was absolutely no crystalline information, and at this time not even from a synthetic compound. So we skipped the step of trying to synthesize it, and we went directly to the computer, came up with yet another 2D structure, which again agrees very, this is the calculated x-ray diffraction pattern, and agree, again agrees very well with what comes from both this guy and this guy. So that's part of the story. The other part of the story that's not on this slide for brevity, I'll just tell you about it without showing it, is that actually on the computer we came up with two possibly stable structures. This was one of them. The other one didn't agree with this at all. So you can ask, okay, so what about the other one? And the answer is that after we did that, the experimentalists went ahead and synthesized the material, and when it's synthesized, it goes into the other structure. So there are actually two predictions, and both of them are correct, just not under the same conditions. And this one is already published, and the other one we're writing up now, the asynthetic one. Okay, so enough about structure. Hopefully I convinced you that under some circumstances we really can obtain the structures predictively even under this relatively complicated circumstances. Uh, let's talk about now properties, starting with mechanical properties. We first got interested in that through a collaboration with Udi Gazit at Tel Aviv University that also involved my friend and colleague Oded Hod, also at Tel Aviv University. So Udi's group synthesized this material. This is a bio so-called biologically inspired material. In other words, it's based on a, on a short peptide known as diphenylalanine, so two units of phenylalanine, which is uh, an amino acid. But it turns out that it packs up in this really nice structure. And when they measured its, uh, its young modulus, they found out that it's a surprisingly high 20 gigapascal. In other words, it's fairly stiff for something that naively you'd expect to be soft and squishy. So they asked us if we could explain it. So the first thing that we did is we calculated its young modulus on the computer, found out that computationally it's 10 gigapascal which is, of course, not exactly as the same as 20, but definitely in the right order of magnitude. By the way, later, uh, we learned through the work of others that actually the difference between 10 and 20, we speculated about it in the paper, but then someone else did the calculation, is because in experiment there are water molecules in those pores, and they make it a little bit stiffer. So actually, this is probably the right result for a completely uh, desiccated sample, but there was some uh, water in the actual samples measured. 
Anyway, so how come it's so stiff? So after a lot of calculation and some modeling, we eventually figured out that it has to do with this structure. You see there's like a tube here, which basically is where all the peptide bonds are. And then there are the structure of interlocking rings, and there are six sets of four interlocking rings throughout, around this tube. And each of the, each uh, uh, quadruplet of, of interacting rings can really be thought of as something that does like this. In other words, it's a zipper structure. And just like in a zipper, if you try to open it just by pulling it on it sideways instead of opening it the proper way, it's tough to do that, right? If you apply enough force, eventually something will break, but it will be hard to do. So it's actually rather stiff. It would be easier if you could really unzip it, but that would, of course, require a chemical reaction as opposed to applying a mechanical stress. So this was the first example for us that uh, weakly bound solids can be rather stiff nevertheless. And actually with the same group, more recently we've shown that this can be stiff and yet if it's thin enough, also quite flexible. This is basically a derivative of this material known as Bock FF. I won't go into the details now, but one can really use it to sort of design some mechanical properties. And then uh, my student Ido Azuri, who also graduated since, who did this work, said, well, you know, if this is what you get for Van der Waals interactions, what will you get with hydrogen bonding, which is in principle a little stronger? So we took uh, the simplest amino acid solid that there is out there based on glycine, and Ido calculated it, uh, calculated the Young modulus along different faces, and he found two different things. First, that the values are really high, even higher than before, as high as many tens of gigapascal. And second, that it's very anisotropic. So this is the Young modulus as a function of direction, and it's all over the place. And that has to do with the relative orientation between where you press from and where the hydrogen bonded the network is. So we asked the experimentalists if they could look into this, the group of Mayer Lahav and, and Igor Lubomirsky, whose picture is somehow missing, and Elena Mayer there was the student uh, looking at this. And when we first suggested in this, they sort of left us out of the room. They said that this is two orders of magnitude too big and we should uh, check our calculations. So we checked our calculations several different ways and always came up with this. So finally we said, well, you know, humor us, and they were willing to do that. And then these are the experimental results, and they really are uh, uh, in very good agreement with the theory, and this is from nano-indentation experiments. So this is a, a case of real prediction. In other words, the case that I showed you here was interpretation. Experiment came first. The reason was unknown. We helped to understand the reason, or at least we hope to ha have helped in that. This was really a prediction in the sense that theory came first and then experiment came. So it really shows you that it can be sufficiently accurate to venture a prediction on. Okay, moving on to a different topic, a, a, a collective electrical property. So as you know, in, elect in electronic materials, a key property is the band gap, the difference in energy between the highest occupied band and the lowest unoccupied band. Now it turns out that in molecular solids, despite the fact that there is no, almost no interaction between the molecules, chemically speaking, there is a huge reduction of the gap as you go from the single molecule to the solid. And the reason is basically an electrostatic response. So if I have one molecule, I can think of all of the molecules surrounding it as a dielectric medium, which means that as I try to pull out an electron from one of them, the rest of the medium polarizes. It's a dielectric response. And so I have a polarization energy. I have an image charge. And so it's easier to pull an electron out. And in a similar way, I gain more energy if I bring an electron in. So this is known as uh, uh, the electric uh, polarization uh, gap renormalization. And one problem with density functional theory, and this is something that we looked at together with a group of my friend and colleague, uh, Jeff Neaton, uh, in Berkeley, is that if you do a calculation of many body perturbation theory, which basically checks explicitly what happens when you remove an electron, but it's difficult and expensive to do these calculations, then you really see this effect. So here is benzene as molecule and solid, pentacene, C60, and in all of them you see this great big renormalization. But if you do DFT with PBE or HSC or PB0 or name your favorite functional, the answer is nothing. So normal DFT is completely blind to this, 
And basically, if you look carefully, you have two problems. First, that the molecular gap is too small. And second, that there is no renormalization as you go from molecule to solid. So how does one solve these problems? So the molecular gap is something that we actually looked at, have been looking at for a number of years. And we have a prescription that I won't go into that is known as the optimally tuned range separated hybrid. Ulrike has also written some very nice papers precisely on, on this point. And the basic idea, without going into the mathematical details, is that you partition uh, the electronic response to a short range and a long range one. The long range you treat one way, specifically with Hart Refock theory, so you get the correct asymptotic potential. The short range you treat a different way with a GGA or a regular hybrid functional, so you get good balance of exchange and correlation in the short range, and together you can overcome the gap problem by demanding that the eigenvalues be the same as, as ionization potentials calculated from total energy differences. So that's a two sentence summary of, of a lot of theory, but just to give you the basic idea. Then we showed that all you really need to do to go from the molecule to the solid is just to add dielectric screening. In other words, if it's really just about the dielectric screening, then the term that asymptotically went to one before, let's have it go to one over epsilon. That's it. And if we do that, then we get those curves in black here. And as far as I know, this was the first DFT method capable of capturing gap renormalization. And again, without dwelling on it too much, this was done on really on periodic calculations of the actual molecular solid in a periodic unit cell. More recently, oh, somehow the slide is missing. Ah, it went here. Okay. More recently, we could see that we can get the same renormalization even without an explicit solid, just by considering one molecule together with a polarizable continuum model that uh, gets this renormalization. So you don't even have to do a full solid calculation, and there are several different papers that were we attack this issue from various uh, points of view. So again, not going through the details right now, but you can even do that. So now, before I head to the second part of my talk, just want to tell you a little bit about optical properties. Can we also calculate optical properties that way? So first of all, yes, we can do optical properties very accurately using, again, many body perturbation theory. This is part of a collaboration with experimentalists in, in Germany where we looked at uh, data that they had on perilene. The reason that we liked it was because this was really exquisite uh, data from an experimental point of view, first of all on crystals with very high crystalline quality, and then followed by very high resolution spectroscopy. So you really have a very solid foundation to work with, really trustworthy experimental data to compare your theory against. And this has a lot of comparison between experiment and theory at various levels, various polarizations, with and without certain approximations. I won't go into the details, but the bottom line is that we can account for all the peaks in the experiment to an accuracy of about 50 mEV or so. So the answer is that yes, again, we can do that, but it's very expensive. So the question is whether we can do that also with time-dependent density functional theory using the same idea that I just told you with this uh, renormalization built into the functional. So this was something that my postdoc Arun Mana looked into. He looked into a set of 23 different solids. I think you'll be relieved to know that I will not take you through those diff 23 different examples. I'll just show you one. And the rest are in the paper for those interested. And that's the uracil solid. So here's what we get. So the, in the black here is many body perturbation theory, which based on the previous slide we can take as a benchmark. This is what you would get with conventional time-dependent DFT. It's really not good. It has a completely spurious peak because the theory thinks that there's charge transfer here, which there isn't, and the rest of the line shape isn't so great either. If you do it, though, with a new approach, then actually the two methods are very close to each other by an acceptable 0.2 EV or so. And I don't even know whether that's mostly an error of the time-dependent DFT or, or some remaining convergence issues of the many-body perturbation theory. So we can also do optical uh, studies this way. And one last thing about this, the same idea can even be extended to conventional solids with one parameter that fixes the gap, which is still semi-empirical, we're trying to get rid of it. And then this is most pronounced for something like lithium fluoride, where experiment tells you that there should be a sharp excitonic absorption feature. 
Standard time-dependent DFT, which is in the gray here, thinks that the absorption is all over the place. So here the agreement between theory and experiment can be described as non-existent, really. But then if you go to the new approach that I just described, we're actually doing very well as we're uh, describing experiment very well and we're doing as well as many body perturbation theory that's in red here. So just to show that we can also address either by interpretation or by design optical properties and this is newer work that has yet to be published on the same on a uh, broader set of semiconductors also with spin orbit coupling etc. It still continues to work. Okay, so these are just some overview uh, articles that address uh, various aspects of this if you uh, want to know more. And of course, I'll be happy to, to discuss with any of you. And for now, I will go on to the second part of my talk, which has to do with hybrid organic and inorganic solids. So first of all, same question that I asked in the beginning, what is a hybrid organic and inorganic solid? Well, it's a crystalline solid that is now partly comprised of an ionic and or covalent network of atoms and partly also has molecules that are really part of the unit cell, not just impurities or something like that. This particular the structure that we're looking at is uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide. So the molecule that you see here is methyl ammonium. There is a network of lead iodide uh, surrounding it, so sort of caging each molecule, and this structure is known as a perovskite structure. Okay? Now, why to look at this structure? Well, it turns out that it's very beneficial photovoltaically. This was part of an overview article that I wrote with two experimentalists at the Weizmann Institute, David Kine and Gary Hodes, some of you may know them, and uh, Tom Brenner was an experimental postdoc, and uh, David Egger was my uh, theoretical postdoc. David is now, uh, now has his own group uh, in Munich. Uh, so it turns out that this has very high efficiency. So these materials were first synthesized in the late 70s already, but kind of like as a game. And in 2009, people started thinking about using them as solar cells and came up with an efficiency of 4%, which is modest which is not commercially viable. But six years later, it already crossed 20%, which is usually, usually considered as the threshold for commercialization. And now the record is 23%. Uh, for perspective, the previous technology that made this hop past the 20% was based on an inorganic solid known as copper indium diselenide. That didn't take six years. That took 40 years from initial discovery to crossing 20%. So just to give you an idea of why this is called a rising star. Before I move on, let me also mention that hybrid organic inorganic materials can also occur naturally. For example, brushite is a mineral that has a calcium phosphate network together with water molecules that are part of the unit cell. If you've never heard of brushite, good for you. Try to keep it that way. It's actually responsible for about 20% of kidney stones. So better not to have it, but from a material science point of view, it is a hybrid organic inorganic material that occurs naturally. Unfortunately, under pathological conditions, not something that you want to have in this case. Okay, going back to perovskites. So if this material is so uh, uh, interesting technologically, the first question to ask was what is its band structure? So many people calculated it. This is our own work, but others have also done that. So this is, you know, most people agree on this. And basically what you see here is a conventional semiconductor. Here is the valence band maximum. Here is the conduction band minimum. And the uh, uh, valence band maximum is mostly iodine p-states. And the conduction band minimum is mostly lead p-states. Uh, and so far it's behaving rather normally. So you may wonder, well, well, then what about the methyl ammonium here? What is it doing? Well, its levels are all the way down here. So really, as far as the semiconducting action is concerned, it's not really participating. So then you could ask, well, so why do I even need that in there? And the answer is, well, if you remove that, then it's not methyl ammonium iodide, it's just lead iodide that's going to collapse to a different structure. It's not going to be a perovskite, and that one has the wrong uh, properties for being a good semiconductor. But still, from that point of view, it looks, so, so technologically, it can still be very interesting. But if that's the whole story, then from a scientific point of view, it's not that interesting. It's just another semiconductor. 
And in that overview article that I just mentioned, we summarize the state of affairs by saying that the most extraordinary feature of the bent structure of methyl ammonium lead iodide is how ordinary it is. So, you know, so that's okay, but that's not exciting scientifically. It can still be a great technology, perhaps, but it's not exciting scientifically. But that's not the whole story. First of all, just to show you that indeed in many ways it does behave like a regular semiconductor. So I just showed you theory, but to show that experiment also con uh, confirms it, we collaborated with a group of Antoine Kahn at Princeton, and we looked at the band structure using photoemission and inverse photoemission. And what that means in, this, in photo emission, you excite electrons out of the system uh, by using uh, strong UV light. So then you basically get a map of the kinetic energies inside the material. And in inverse photoemission, you probe empty states by doing the opposite. You irradiate the sample with electrons, they get trapped, and you monitor the light coming out of the sample. So you can also have some energy distribution of the empty states. So in all those, we compare theory and experiment. Experiment is in blue and the theory is in green. And in all of them, you can see that there's reasonably good agreement, which allows you to also interpret the spectrum and say which peak is due to which orbitals predominantly, and so on and so forth. So again, all of that behaves more or less as you would see in an ordinary semiconductor. But more recently, we have uh, seen over and over and over again that this is actually far from a usual semiconductor. Because if you start looking at the detail, this picture of the ideal bulk gradually disappears. And what emerges instead is a lot of structural dynamics already at room temperature. There's molecular rota the molecule rotates, the octahedra distorts, ions diffuse around even at room temperature. There's many things that are uh, quite different from what you'd expect. And this is work that we've been pursuing with David that I already mentioned and my friend and colleague Andrew Rapp at the University of Pennsylvania. And these are a couple of overview articles. I'll have more to say about one of them a little bit later. So I won't talk about all that's in here. I'll give you a couple of examples. So for us, the first indication that something here is not quite the way we would normally see it is when we started looking at experimental reports about the electron mobility and hole mobility that people find. So the thing is, um, this is a little bit cut here, so I'm not sure that you can see it, but it says our mobility is in hybrid organic and inorganic perovskites actually high. Why? We kept reading reports of, oh, look, they are so high, they are so high, they are so high. But then you look at the numbers and you realize that a lot of people, you know, that this is, these are the values, about 100 centimeters square per volt second or so. Now, is that a high value or not? Well, a lot of people moved into this field after working with organic photovoltaics where it's lower by two to three orders of magnitude. And then, yeah, you know, this is great. But then I already showed you that this is more like a conventional semiconductor. So it's not fair to compare it to a molecular solid like pentacene. One should compare it to silicon or gallium arsenide. And if you do that, it's not really that exciting anymore. So then people told us, well, you know, but that's not fair. You should compare it to lead-based uh, semiconductors because this has lead. So fine. So here's lead telluride and lead sulfide. They're different from each other, but they're, again, at least half an order of magnitude and maybe one and a half orders of magnitude more than that. So something is going on. It's not an ordinary semiconductor in that respect. So one uh, major piece of information that gave us clues as to what was going on was achieved in collaboration uh, uh, with people from Columbia University, specifically Louis Bruce and Tony Heinz. Tony has since moved. And, and Omar Yaffe, who was the PhD student, uh, I'm sorry, the postdoc doing this work. So they were looking at methyl ammonium lead bromide in this case, and they were doing Raman spectroscopy. And the thing is that unlike the usual Raman spectroscopy, they were doing Raman at very low uh, frequencies. And what they saw, there are various phases here depending on the temperature, but they saw that as they go up to room temperature, they actually have a broad peak here, which shouldn't exist at all for the ideal solid. And that is usually this, uh, uh, ascribed to some kind of disorder. But this is a crystalline material. If you do an X-ray diffraction experiment, you will get an X-ray diffraction pattern, right? So what's going on? So the thought was that maybe there's some dynamic disorder. Things are moving about, even though on, on average they're still crystalline. 
And when Omer showed this to me, you know, frankly, I said, look, okay, the molecule, we already know that the molecule rotates, so if the molecule rotates, it's pulling the octahedra a little bit, and that's why you have some disorder, so okay, not that exciting. But then they went back and they did another experiment. They did this on a related material, except that it's now fully inorganic, in a sense that the methyl ammonium is replaced by cesium. And as you can see, at slightly different temperatures, but the same picture remains. And now you can no longer argue it away by saying, okay, look, the molecule rotates. The molecule doesn't rotate for the trivial reason that there is no molecule. So now one has to come up with a better explanation. So what we did then is we did extensive molecular dynamics based on DFT, which is what uh, David did. And then Liang Tan, who was uh, then a postdoc with Andrew, took these data and basically computed the Raman spectrum from something known as the polarization autocorrelation function. I won't go into the details, but of course you're welcome to ask me about it. And this is theory and experiment at two temperatures. Now, I wouldn't characterize the agreement as perfect, but it's reasonable enough to start understanding the trends for, from, especially at the higher temperature. So what did we actually learn from that? So let's look at a piece of uh, molecular dynamics. So what you see on the top left is the average structure. This is what you get from the X-ray diffraction. This is what it looks like statically. But how does it look actually if I go over some time? So you see that it actually, oh, I'm sorry, I stopped this in the middle. Let me go again. So you see that it actually oscillates uh, fairly wildly. The octahedra distorts, the cesium atoms move back and forth. There's a lot of action here. Now, in every solid, there's always a lot of action of this kind if you bring it close to the melting point. But this is not close to the melting point. It's still actually pretty far from the melting point. So what's going on? So what we could see is that, indeed, there's a lot of short-range, short-time distortion. So for example, if you take the molecular dynamics data and you average it over 20 picoseconds, then on average you'll see the perfect cubic structure that you'd expect to see. But if you average it over just one picosecond, it's actually quite distorted. So you have polar distortions on the order of a few hundreds of femtoseconds, which is exactly the order of time relevant for electron transport. So surely this disorder is going to affect mobility, and that's one explanation for why the mobility is lower than you would expect it to be at room temperature. And then we later also confirmed this in, in experimental work with Robert Lovrinchich from Heidelberg, who did uh, uh, far infrared experiments. And the same thing, he compared lead iodide to methyl ammonium lead iodide. He was able to resolve the transverse optical phonon from absorption in the longitudinal optical phonon for both materials. And you can see that for the lead iodide in red, you have fairly sharp peaks. And for the methyl ammonium lead iodide, they're much broader which is, again, an indicator of dynamic disorder. And something else, another experiment that shows this is a beautiful experiment from Aaron Lindenberg at, at Stanford, where basically he did electron diffraction, but with femtosecond resolution as the sample is illuminated, which means that he can really go ahead and see those distortions occurring in real time due to illumination. I won't go into all of the details, primarily because when we did molecular dynamics for this, it's not so much that we explained what the effect is, but rather what it isn't. What do I mean by that? So Aaron was able to show that there is a broadening in the peak corresponding to iodine-iodine distances, but lead-iodine distances are maintained, which means that the octahedron mostly distorts. Now that's not what we got from the molecular dynamics, even if we elevated the temperature which means that there is some photochemical effect which is actually different from just local heating. What it is requires molecular dynamics with time-dependent DFT, and that's more than we can do at the moment, but it goes to show that there are a lot of subtle effects uh, uh, in this material. The latest of which is actually the work of my student Ayala Cohen, where she now took a defect, a bromine vacancy in this material, and then showed that there are some fluctuations in the band gap but there are huge fluctuations in the defect energy, which means that the picture of a static energy associated with the vacancy, that's completely broken too, 
and that surely has to affect how, how charge carriers are uh, captured and or scattered in this material because the same defect is sometimes deeper and sometimes more shallow. So you see that uh, uh, what is really uh, unique about this material is this combination of a material that is on the one hand a proper electronic material, on the other hand is rather soft. Again, not squishy soft, but much softer than say silicon or gallium arsenide. So in this recent uh, review article, which we, called with, which we wrote with many other groups, sort of a status update on, we called it, what remains unexplained about halide perovskites, and we sort of went through a property of, uh, a list of properties that are unusual about them, in terms of structure, properties, formation, etc. So we had a list of 15 properties overall, and we could establish that actually not a single of those is unprecedented. Each of those is known from other materials. But this is the only material known so far which has all 15 of them together in one sample. And that is highly unusual. So that's a playground that we've been playing with which we think is important both technologically and in terms of basic science because the basic science of semiconductors assumes that the atoms at most, you know, just have harmonic motion about the mean and doesn't allow for uh, uh, considerations of a uh, much larger, nonlinear, large amplitude effects. So in some sense, we have to work out the textbook again because the usual textbook doesn't apply here. So it's also a lot of fun from the basic science point of view. Okay, and that brings me to my concluding slide. Uh, I showed you a little of our recent work on some examples of our recent work on molecular and hybrid crystals. I hope I was able to convince you that they exhibit a range of collective properties which manifests itself sometimes in unexpected structures and sometimes in unusual properties, mechanical, electrical, optical, and actually also magnetic that I didn't have time to talk about today because enough is enough for one talk. And um, uh, that's, so that's one thing. And the other lesson is that throughout I try to show you that modern DFT approaches certainly teach us about such solids, but at the same time also learn from them. There are some aspects, some properties that are actually challenging for conventional functionals and force us to think about the approximations and develop new ones so that we can keep going. And if we do that, if we compare experiment and theory carefully while always keeping an open mind about discrepancies, thinking carefully whether they arise from limitations of the theory or limitations of the experiment, then in the end we can really make true predictions possible. So with this I'll stop. I'll thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions if you have them. Yes. As I understand, these are monomers, and there is no connectivity. How do you think connectivity, chain connectivity, can change, can change this picture, the experimental result, if I am in C23 glycine connected? Right, so in this case, indeed, each glycine, as you said correctly, let me just quickly roll back to there so that we can look at the picture. Yeah, this one. So indeed, each glycine molecule is a monomer here, and the co connection between monomers is mostly by hydrogen bonding and some dispersive interaction. So surely if you start creating chains, I mean covalent bonds are stronger. So I'm assuming that directions which have covalent linking will become even stiffer. Whether that comes at the expense of other directions or not depends on what changes in the bonding in other directions. I think it could change the effective interaction because the young modulus, right, is not the strength itself. It's by how much really you see a change as you start applying uh, 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 stress to the sample. So yeah, it could change. I think it will de depend on the general chemistry of the problem. But the good news is that this appears to be a general methodology with which you can ad address such questions and develop intuition for a specific chemical system. Okay. We know now the mobility is not particularly good. 
and it could be better if the thing was stiffer. What exactly makes the perovskite now so special as a, as a solar system than the others? So I think, and that, that goes back to something that I hinted at at the end, but I didn't dwell on much. Now I can say a bit more about it. So let me go back here. So I think this is partly related to this. In other words, unlike, say, if you're trying to build a transistor, if you're trying to build a solar cell, mobility is not your primary concern. In other words, what you need is something where you can really generate a lot of uh, photovoltage per a given level of illumination. And there, often, what really kills a solar cell is defects. Now here, one tentative explanation is that this behavior may actually be beneficial. Because suppose that a, a charge carrier is trapped. And a little bit later, the level will become shallow because it keeps fluctuating and the charge can be released. So perhaps this is one way uh, in which uh, electronic performance or photovoltaic performance is enhanced. There's also a lot of discussion about this softness. We've actually seen some of that in, in other materials earlier. Soft, this kind of softness is not necessarily a terrible thing in the sense that it can also lead to what we call uh, self-healing in the sense that if a defect is formed, you know, the material jiggles and wiggles and it will also uh, kick it out at some point. Unlike something stiff like gallium arsenide, where if a defect is formed, it's there, whether you like it or not. And it's not going anywhere except under special uh, circumstances. So these are all tentative guesses. There is no definitive proof, but that's kind of our present intuition about what could make this special as a, as a useful photovoltaic material. Probably, according to scattering theory, it's wrong, but my gut feeling would be, if anything is in motion, why are the electrons not moving more? Because there's a lot of dynamics, there's a lot of energy to move. The distances are constantly changing, so an electron cannot hop one moment, but it can hop the next one. Right, but the question is whether this will help concerted motion, because you want to go in a certain direction, and then, if it's completely periodic, that's actually beneficial. And any deviation from periodicity will make this more random, less directional. So that's in a nutshell. Can you control this fluctuation by applying some filters? Perhaps. I don't know that that's been done. It's possible. Other questions? Over there. It's again related to the mm -hmm. issue as a stability. That's right. Right, so I don't know that there has been a breakthrough there. You're right, stability is an issue. Stability is an issue for any solar cell technology because basically if you put a solar cell, say, up on your roof, by definition you are exposing it to fairly hard conditions, right? Uh, first of all, excitation from the sun, it will get hot, etc. And you want it to last for a good while, otherwise it's not worth it. So stability is always a primary concern. And these uh, materials do have stability issues. So the downside of softness is that it can lead to instabilities. What we now know is that a major culprit in the instability is water. And that is known experimentally now, also, known theor also established theoretically, not our work in this case, but still established theoretically, that water uh, have a huge detrimental effect. So I guess the good news is that water is something you could in principle think about encapsulating against. Uh, I think that is right now the state of the art. A lot of people are working on that. It's an open issue and an issue that is certainly crucial if this is really to become a successful commercial technology at some point. Mm -hmm. Here, in this case? or So in this case, this is just our preliminary work on this, so this is really the only system we've done so far. Part of our agenda is really now to map other defects and other compounds and see whether it's a larger or smaller effect. So I'm definitely not claiming that this will be such a dramatic effect for every, possi every chemical possibility here because we don't know that yet. All I'm saying is that in most textbooks you will assume that the defect is static. And what I'm saying is, is that it's not necessarily enough. And for that all I need is one counterexample and this is it. Okay?
Mm -hmm. um, what kind of material can be chosen to decrease off the tilting uh, of the of the hydrant? Because this uh, causes of the instability of the material. Right. So I guess it depends. For example, if you move away from halide perovskites to oxide perovskites, where the formal charges are larger, you have much less of these issues. But the downside then is that they tend to be insulators, so large gap insulators, so they're not useful uh, for photovoltaics. They're useful for other things. Some of them are excellent piezoelectric materials, for example, etc., even commercially, but they're not good uh, uh, materials for photovoltaics. So the general answer is, is we don't know yet. From the theoretical point of view, what could be done, and I think some people are trying to do that, is to do what's called material screening or high throughput calculations or materials genome. There are all kinds of different names for the same thing, which is to take a library of materials on the computer, try different combinations, and see if you can identify something that would still be useful uh, as a photovoltaic material in terms of its electronic and optical properties, but would not be as soft. So that would be one possible strategy. I don't know that there are any results of that kind yet, at least. There may be, may or may not be in the future. Other questions? No? All right, then. Thank you again. Thank you very much.